In this our second last module, we're going to look uh, at least introduce you to node-based parametric programming. The idea being using uh, math, geometry, uh, definitions of geometry to create our forms and our architecture. And our project is going to be to make these, um, I guess, curvaceous ceiling tiles, this responsive ceiling, based on this uh, line on the ground that we draw, a NURBS line. Um, and if we manipulate this line, the shape of the ceiling plane changes. And that's all based on the proximity of the line to any one of the panels that's up here. So it's a relatively sophisticated and fun project. And um, like I said, it's an introduction to get you started into the uh, really um, extensive world of this kind of uh, design work. So a little close up of what I was showing in that graphic before. Um, the idea of these nodes, um, things like number sequences, um, a circle defined by a point and a radius in this case. Uh, these are watch boxes to tell you what kind of information is in them. And um, we have other, um, other ways of doing this and other kinds of software. In our uh, Revit BIM modeling environment, it's called Dynamo. And the boxes are gray. And the programming is almost identical to what is also done in Rhino, an, another modeler system. Um, that has a plugin called Grasshopper. So um, I'm sure these terms are a little bit unfamiliar to you at this point or seem odd. Uh, but um, for our, our, our coursework and, and actually a lot of future work that you can do, you can just think of Dynamo as the uh, programming environment for the, the Rhino Pro, or excuse me, the Revit program that we use. So when we work through this project, you may think that the it has limited applications. and the first thing I want to do is give you a few slides to kind of dispel, um, I guess, that kind of thinking. Um, here we have an analysis of a site um, done by using Dynamo, where we um, input um, all of the possible positions of the sun, rotate it around a site, and then do an analysis of the amount of sunlight that's hitting any of the surfaces. So we can do things like shading and other functionality right within inside of Revit, but when we want to compute multiple numbers, multiple times of day, and, and make things more sophisticated, so to speak. Um, Dynamo is one of our go-to tools for solving these um, more complex analysis. Another place where it can be very useful, and it might seem a little bit tedious um, as an early designer, but here we have what might be a hospital complex, and um, all of the floors have on them at any, you know, on any one level may have multiple functions. And they're defined in this case by color. And one of the ways um, that might be interesting for um, you as an architect needing to make a presentation is to say, well, I'm going to make all of the offices uh, purple. I'm going to make all of the um, waiting rooms green and so on and so forth. And then you can tediously go through and make a, a map like this. Or you could use software that would say, wherever I've labeled anything as a waiting room, I want to color it green. And in the software that you write, you could have that done automatically. And the benefit of that is that when you make a change to what you label a space, it'll automatically be updated in the drawing system for you. So you don't have to go back and recolor and or relabel it. Um, so, you know, obviously that's um, kind of a workflow benefit type use of the tool. There's also the possibilities, the emerging possibilities of doing structural analysis using these tools. So here we have a wireframe of what might be a, a, a covering or a floor system. And um, the green lines are showing loads applied. And the, um, uh, the frame you can see deflecting away all part of this idea of node-based parametric um, design work, inputting loads into formulas, calculating deflections, and then re-visualizing them in the, the um, programming environment that we have to be uh, that we happen to be in. In this case, we're in um, Rhino using Grasshopper to do our modeling. And here's another example, a little more in detail. And you can see some of these nodes get very complex. For instance. Uh, this green one here has deformation of the load, the, how, what, the level of the loads, where the support areas are. All of these things can be adjusted and manipulated so that you can get an in-depth analysis of what, in this case, is a structural system. 
But it's not limited to just that kind of analysis either. Um, one of the complex things that we uh, sometimes come upon is we create a curve shape and we want to be able to cut out the components of that. And, and for that, it requires unpeeling or unwrapping um, the surfaces of our, our complex geometry and laying them flat so they can be cut out of a material like steel and or plywood. And so uh, we can write um, software, um, node-based parametric software, that allows us to unroll these objects and lay them flat on a surface. So then we can use tooling um, to cut panel systems um, to actually make the sculpture and or whatever artifact we're building. We also um, can use it to do things like make um, um, adaptive systems. In this case, we're looking at a visual, and I'll click through it uh, to the web page, where um, the system is responding acoustically, the, the ceiling panels, to alter the acoustics of the space. For instance, um, possibly as it gets noisier, it might open up and allow these uh, perforated areas more exposure to help soak up sound in the environment. And they can be motorized, in this case, um, dynamically. So here we have actuators um, that when, um, are, when actuated um, can unfold or fold up the enclosure and thereby affecting the acoustics of the room. And obviously, it's, it's really clear to see how this can get very complicated very quickly. And this is where the idea of using these programming tools can become very useful. Uh, this one, is the, the video link is gone for it, but I kept the slide in anyway. The idea here is this is a responsive surface. A uh, gentleman is lifting his hands. The panels are curving accordingly. Um, this is driven by a computer system. But once again, based on that idea of using a programming environment behind it, and in many cases, um, these things are becoming very popular because of the accessibility for architects uh, to use this complex software to generate all kinds of surfaces, in this case, an active surface that responds to human motion. Um, there are quite a few firms, um, but a few in specific that um, really um, have adapted well to this complex um, programming environment to create really stunning architectural um, uh, projects, where in this case we have um, Morphosis. I'll have a couple of slides. But we have this kind of an articulation of the facade, um, very complicated um, uh, shapes generated um, numerically um, through our programming environment, and then able to be cut out on machines to make the, um, the panel systems that can be then uh, what looks like precast concrete. And they've done, uh, this is a, a really typical um, application for node-based uh, parametric um, design work. This idea, this is, um, I believe, Emerson College, and uh, these aluminum panels on the facade of the building, giving this feeling of wind blowing through or wind motion, are crafted through um, that programming environment. We have some examples of that same thing happening here right nearby in Corning. Um, this is the Bill and Melinda Gates, I think it's Computational Center or something like this on the Corn Cornell campus. And once again, we have this idea of, of a facade, dynamic facade, responding to some kind of input, whether it be data or um, wind motion or something on the site. And this is just another view of that, um, that hall. And then we have a, a few companies that are really uh, heavily invested in uh, making these tools available to architects and designers. Um, this one is let me think of the name of the company right now, Zaner. They're a metal uh, fabricator in the Midwest. And they, um, uh, they've covered their shop with what they call a cloud, a fin-based system. And they make this technique of making these kind of facades available to their customers um, in the same way that we would uh, write our own programs to cut out these kind of fins. They've actually made them available on a website. So you can come. Um, to the website, input data for the height, the width of the wall, and then what kind of input you want to control the shape, how many fins you want, and then they will custom fabricate it and deliver it and possibly even install it on your work site. 
So that idea of being able to move all kinds of data, whether it be wind flow or sound waves, transfer them into a physical uh, form. Um, we can also take photographic images, digital images, and cut holes in panel systems. So here we have a facade um, on a building um, in New York City, on, <clears throat> excuse me, in Brooklyn. And um, a photograph has been scanned into um, uh, to our um, programming environment. And where it's dark, um, the machine, uh, the code is told to open up a, a large hole. And where there is bright light, there is either a very small hole or no hole. And so by controlling the size and the relationships of all of those um, elements, size of the hole and location, um, you can create um, a, um, a facade with an image um, articulated through cutouts. And these kind of ideas keep going and going and they're complex um, and um, it's not really the only way you have to go with this node based programming but it is typically one of the ways that um, we create this kind of sophisticated architecture and shapes and forms um, here we have a, a little bit of close-up these are these are hyperlinked so if you click on through them they'll take you to the websites if you're interested in more information on any specific project and I've experimented a little inside of Revit and Dynamo and found you can really basically do the same kind of form generation um, you know, pretty quickly. Um, although this isn't going to be a project that I'm going to assign, we're going to start out just with our ceiling system. This idea of taking data and then making it visible, um, this is a, a slideshow by IBM um, where they did cutouts in a panel according to some data that they had synthesized into form. And I won't play the whole video, but you can see that this is a display wall with inside of the facility, uh, kind of masking out a conference room or something like that. The data is based on digital sales of mobile devices. So just a really a random piece of data and then interpolated into a shape using um, a programming environment. And they're cut, um, in this case they were CNC milled. And a bit of a promotional piece of this. So um, well, once again, empowered by that ability to use, um, to use math to create form. And I've done a very simple thing also for a client. Um, this is a client that I consulted for, Rigidized Metals, um, a rehab of a little a facility that they had, and the idea of creating a Warnoi um, pattern for screen protection for window systems. So on the left, we have the panels in place. Um, at right, this would be the, the basic opening. And the concern by the client um, was that this is in an exposed industrial area, and we were really afraid that somebody would just throw rocks through these windows and vandalize it. So the idea of these screen curtains uh, was to prevent um, large objects from being able to break the glass. So the form uh, was based on math. And some of the and so um, I'll, sh I'll shoot ahead here a couple of panels. Um, the idea of the layout was based on a Voronoi and a, a distribution of um, cells. And then I seeded them to create the sense of randomness. So you can see these additional points that I placed in here. And they would cause a relaxation of the uh, Voronoi pattern in specific areas. So where there were no points, you'll see how the, 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 the pattern gets denser. And there, I guess it was in my intention to make it feel like there was a motion to it, a waviness of grains of uh, uh, grain growing. Um, this is Silo City, um, grain mills around, and I wanted it to have that kind of field-like feeling to it. I'm not exactly sure how much that was accomplished, but um, this is now that, um, that math laid out into panels that could then be fabricated into the final, into the final system. And uh, to show you, this wasn't done in Revit, but this was done in Rhino and Grasshopper. As I said, um, that's the same thing as Revit and Dynamo. And here we have a really simple program 
that just creates X and Y coordinates, 48 inches by 96 inches defines the panel size. And then we seat it. We add a Voronoi pattern to it. And um, we then offset each one of the lines so that we get this kind of a thickness to it. And we could actually control how large the thickness of the rib was by using the slider here. Um, but I'm, I'm showing you this just to show you how easy this kind of creation of this uh, kind of pattern is. And depending on where you go with it, many colleges see this as actually a rite of passage to create these kind of complicated structures built out of all kinds of materials. And I wanted you to have, uh, it's something that we don't do here at Alfred, um, but many colleges do. You may go on to master's level work or relationships with other college where um, this idea of an understanding of these programming environments would be very important. Here we have um, just uh, one last, I guess, specific project, Fulton Center. We've had some that seemed a little far off, and so that might feel a little removed for you. And I thought it would be important to put the Fulton Center in because what they've created is an oculus inside. And the geometry is relatively complex, even though it appears simple. Um, the top and bottom of the oculus have it, um, are two openings, but they have a taper coming up to them. And they have metal panels mounted on a, um, a mesh grid system. And so this could be an application where you're doing something um, decorative inside of a facility that just doesn't seem all that complex. But once you start having to deal with hundreds of nodes floating out in a steel mesh grid system with uh, panels attached to them, it really can become very complex to understand. And this is where our uh, this is where these techniques can become very useful. So once again, our final project um, will hopefully start to give you a little better understanding of how these tools work. Just a brief introduction. And I'm going to talk a little bit next about our project of texturing. I'm going to stop the recording and make this into another section.